With the release of Diablo 4 comes a brand new addition to one of my personal favorite franchises. And in this video, we will be breaking down absolutely everything that transpires throughout the campaign story from start to finish. So get yourself a coffee and a snack, sit back and relax because this is going to be a long one. Let's get into the breakdown. We can see a cold, desolate landscape, while an unnamed narrator gives us an explanation of the history of Sanctuary, saying that Sanctuary was never meant for mankind. Instead, it was forged as a refuge from the war between the heavens and hell itself. However, it did just end up becoming another battlefield in the conflict. A secretive group called the Herodrum has kept mortals safe during this conflict. But it's now a shadow of its former self, as Sanctuary's ancient creators have now returned to claim the hearts of mankind. This is a story of their downfall. As dusk begins to set in, our protagonist finds an ominous statue as whispers begin filling the surrounding trees. Our horse makes a crucial survival mistake and runs towards the creepy voices. It turns out exactly as you would expect. Our only light goes out as the whispers grow louder but thankfully we learn from our horse's mistake and make a quick exit. As the new day begins, the weather continues to get worse. Our protagonist finds a cave that we can use as shelter from the elements and takes a quick rest at the entrance. I mentioned in the beta video that I have watched my fair share of survival shows in my time, and I stand by the fact that you do not fall asleep in the cold without a fire. It is a very quick way to lose some of your digits. And to be fair, sleeping next to satanic wolves is also adding another very quick way of losing digits, or you know, your soul. Surprisingly, against all odds, we awake and decide to find better shelter in a nearby town. We manage to find an abandoned town called Nevesk, where we hear some voices coming from a nearby barn. Turns out, not an abandoned town. The people in the barn are talking about demons in the darkness, while one of them is complaining about an injury from a bite. Apparently, the bite victim wandered into town and began causing trouble. He begins speaking about demons that are spilling out from a nearby ruin and that they will kill them all. The lovely and totally not evil locals take us to their tavern and explain how a ruin from the north has evil stirring from within and that the monk must have gone inside. Adding that even a holy man like himself is not safe from being driven mad by the evils held within. We can begin to see that this town has its own small community. As Vani asks us to help the town by protecting them from the demons that are spilling out of the ruins, we agree to help and head out. We get to the ruins and it is exactly as described, a complete den of Satan's greatest hits, but we do manage to get the best of them and return back to town. They declare us the community's one true hero and thank us profusely for saving the town before inviting us to some festivities, lots of beer and food in celebration of our achievement. And it's great! We start partying it up with the locals, and before we know it, we've been roofied, passed out, dribbling all over the damn table. It takes all but five seconds before Oswin starts wheeling in a wheelbarrow to drag us out of the tavern. I mean, this is a crap situation, but you have to commend the efficiency. But I have seen horror films and evil townspeople working together against the tourist always end one way. Human sacrifice. You j just wait, you'll see. We get an interesting proverb come up while we get some much needed shut eye, and I quote, I saw my corpse, and from my mouth crawled hatred. A father burned his children on a pyre, and a mother molded a new age from the ashes. I saw the weak made strong, a pack of lambs feasting on wolves. Tears of blood rained on a desert jewel, and the way to hell has torn asunder. Then came a spear of light, piercing hatred's heart. And he who was bound in chains was set free. This is described as Rathma's prophecy, something we'll learn much more about as we progress through the acts. We get wheeled out of the barn behind the town, and let's just say that the saying business in the front, party in the back has never made so much sense. Oswin grabs some petals and begins some form of ritual by feeding us blood. A man comes from behind and helps us out, and we have to fight the locals. We thank the locals for their hospitality, and as Vani dies, she mentions that we are now blessed like them now. It's revealed that the man was actually the holy man from the barn earlier. He explains that the heretics drugged him after he returned from the ruins, just like us. When he came to his wits, he tried to escape but couldn't get inside the chapel since it was locked. The recent events catch up to us as we begin throwing up. Yosef points out that we're actually vomiting blood and petals, not 
petals in blood, but literal petals made from blood. We tell him that they fed it to us, and he believes that it's from a ritual, stating that we should head to the chapel to find answers since they must keep it locked for a good reason. Inside, we find more blood petals on the ground. As we inspect them, we see a vision from the past. The church's bell tolls for morning prayer, with the laughter of children filling the surrounding area. This town used to be quite a happy place. The townspeople gather and we can see that one of them is Varney. The priest begins to call them shameful, since the father has granted them a path to salvation, but they stray from it at every opportunity. Drinking, gambling, stealing, all shameful acts. Blood petals begin falling from above the priest, landing on his Bible. We can hear the voice of Lilith from behind. She tells the priest that sin is their birthright. We get this really cool but equally creepy shot of the demonic silhouette being contrasted by the church's window. She tells the townspeople that the lords of hell are coming to devour this world, and that their salvation is not in the light, but instead in themselves. That their faith has taught them to deny their heart's desire, and turn them into a prisoner within themselves. The priest is having a mild end of life crisis at this stage. The townspeople are slowly turning to Lilith's way of thinking, and the priest notices this and pleads with them to resist her temptations. It ends really poorly for the priest as Lilith speaks to a man named Elias. He tells her that the townspeople have awakened. She responds that they are just the first of many and that their true work begins now. We awake outside the church and speak to Yosef about our vision. When he hears the description of Lilith, he tenses up, stating that it can't be possible. He explains that he must report back to the cathedral immediately, telling us to look for a hermit to the north. He apparently has questionable loyalty but knows about the Forbidden, asking us to bring the hermit to the cathedral in Kjolvashat. We agree and head north. We arrive at the cabin and find it empty, taking the opportunity to look for clues. The hermit arrives home with a deer and invites us to supper. I must say, a very surprising way to treat a home invader ruffling through your belongings. We tell him about everything that has happened thus far, and he mentions that the reason for our visions is due to the villagers feeding us the blood of Lilith, the daughter of hatred and mother of sanctuary. She was banished ages ago and this entire world was her creation. He says that it was prophesied that she would return one day. We ask what it is that she wants and he says that he doesn't know. Only that sanctuary has been a battleground for the conflict between angels and demons but Lilith doesn't actually serve either side. Instead, she has her own plans for humankind. We ask if we're now corrupted since we've drunk her blood, to which the hermit says that he isn't sure but we undoubtedly share a connection with her now. We pledge to use this new connection to figure out what she's after. The hermit agrees to help us. We reach Kjovashad and the hermit, whose name is Lorith Nar, buys a horse from the town stables and we ask him what he's doing. He says that while we go to the cathedral, he plans to head out to the dry steps and search for the pale man from our vision. He is referring to Elias. We go on to ask him about Anarius, and he tells us how the cathedral loved to go on about him, his imprisonment in hell, his valiant escape and then his glorious return to sanctuary, the world that he created. This is the entity that the priest from the vision was referring to as the father. He is an angel, not God if you understandably mistook that. But he and Lilith are jointly responsible for the creation of Sanctuary. Anarius is the father while Lilith is the mother of Sanctuary, the shared creation of a demon and angel. He asks us to retrieve some things from the local blacksmith, which turns out to be his old weapon and amulet, suggesting that he led a very interesting life before becoming a hermit. As he begins to leave, we hear the narration again, this time revealing that the narrator is actually Lorith Nar. Speaking from the future on what would be past events, he says how at the time, after meeting us, he believed that he had a chance to protect humanity from the Daughter of Hatred, that the Wanderer's connection to her gave him hope, only to begin laughing, suggesting that his having hope was stupid in hindsight. We head to the Cathedral of Light and find Yosef before the Reverend Mother Prava. She is giving him a blessing. Yosef asks us why Lorith didn't accompany us, and what could possibly be of more import. We respond with only one word, Lilith. Mother Prava explains that she received word from one of her knights of a demon that matches our description of Lilith exactly, asking us to travel to Yelesna to verify the sightings. She initially intended to send Lorath, but since he didn't arrive, we will be taking his place. We head to Yelesna mines and meet a knight named Vigo. There is a young woman nearby that yells at Vigo, saying that she knows what she saw. 
A horned demon that walked past where we stand. She is concerned since her mother is with that demon and begins questioning Vigo why he would let her mother through. Vigo explains that it's fine since they have soldiers stationed inside. Nairal says that he should be worried for them as well before turning to us and asking us for help finding her mother. She tells us that she studies the Herodrum alongside her mother, that they were on something big but her mother ran off, which is unusual for her to just abandon the hunt like that. We tell Vigo that the Reverend Mother sent us, and tell him that the horned woman is the demon Lilith. This scares Nairal, since her mother has taught her the name when she was young, mentioning that she is the fabled daughter of hatred. Vigo agrees to lead us into the mine, fearing that the Reverend Mother would be angry at him. While inside the mine, Nairal notices that Vigo is wearing her mother's charm on his wrist. Vigo says that it's now his, since she gave it to him when he let her and her friend pass through. We arrive at an internal door and hear mumbling from the other side. It turns out to be the station knights. Most of them dead on the floor, but luckily one is still breathing, barely. Vigo asks him what happened and the knight responds that it was the woman that they were escorting. Not Nairal's mother, but the woman accompanying them. Saying that she wasn't human, that she turned into a demon, claiming that she mothered sanctuary and then it was just a bloodbath. Nairal asks him what happened to Venard, her mother. The knight responds that she begged for her life. Lilith spared her and led her deeper inside the mine. The knight tells Vigo that nothing worked on Lilith, that he needs to tell Prava to raise the army, and that the father himself needs to know that evil itself walks within sanctuary. Vigo is angry that Venard told him that the charm would bring him good fortune, feeling that he was lied to. Nero realizes that her mother bribed Vigo with the charm so that he would allow her inside the mine, since nobody was actually meant to be let through at all. Nairal believes that her mother can still be saved, but Vigo says that he will not continue onwards. He will report back to Prava. Nairal calls him a coward and asks us to help her, which we agree to do. As we make our way through the demon-infested mines, we find blood petals on the floor. When we touch them, we can see small glimpses of the past, this time the conversations between Lilith and Venard. We can see from the beginning that Venard is terrified of Lilith, but Lilith tells her that she has what she seeks knowledge even dragging her child across sanctuary in pursuit of it and since she knows the very fabric of the cosmos she can give her all the answers to those questions venard is concerned since everything that she has ever read has warned her against lilith with lilith mentioning that she has read so much yet knows so little venard reluctantly agrees to the offer of knowledge we can find these stones with writing across them that were left by venard giving us some backstory on what happened the first stone tells us that Lilith saw a way to escape the eternal conflict between heaven and hell. It started with the seduction of the angel Inarius, and as it turns out, he was just as valuable as any man. The second stone explains that she used Inarius to craft this world, which shocked Venard since the true origin of the world came from the union of a demon and angel, and from that came the first generation of humanity. That first generation was powerful able to move mountains and even shake the seas. Vanan mentions that Lilith was especially proud in the telling of this particular part, that she bore a son together with an Arius named Rothma. He was the first to untangle the power of necromancy, and his lair lies further within the mine. Lilith mentions that she can sense Vanad as curious, why she was spared before telling her that she is going to meet her son. Lilith describes him as being the key to her plans. The next vision shows Lilith mentioning just how she can sense the pain from within Venard, and that she misses her daughter. Venard says that she knows that her daughter will be scared right now. So, Lilith gives her a choice. She can go or she can stay. Venard chooses to stay, saying that her daughter will be fine since she's strong. Lilith is happy with this choice, and tells her that to reach Rathma, they will need to perform a ritual, which she will teach her. And the first lesson is that blood is the key. We manage to find Venard, who has drawn patterns and writing in her own blood on the ground. When Nairal approaches, she tells her daughter that across the necropolis is a trove of magic and knowledge. She opened the way for Lilith, but she could not pass through with her because she lacked the divine element. Nairal pleads with her mother to stop, concerned by her mother writing in her own blood. We can begin to see that Venard has changed significantly, telling her that Lilith has awakened her, showing her things that she can't even put into words. Nairal tells her that she couldn't care what she showed her and attempts to grab her mother's arm to guide her out of the mines. Venard pulls a knife out on her own daughter, calling her clever, trying to lead her away so she can take all of this for herself. 
definitely short a few marbles, if you know what I'm saying. She cuts Nero on the arm, and she tells her that she will now finish drawing these runes with our blood instead. She goes full demonic witch mode and begins summoning demons to fight us. We manage to fight them off, but it ends with Venard dying. Nero is distraught and says that Lilith will pay for what she's done, telling us to go back to Reverend Mother Prava to get blessed, allowing us to enter Rothma's tomb, before asking us to meet her in the Mistral Woods, which contains a hidden vault that belonged to the Herodrum long ago. We head to Corvalar and find Vigo near a pyre. He is burning the bodies of the lost knights from the mine. He tells us that he came clean to Prava about taking the woman's bribe, stating that it's looking bad. He might not even have a job when she's done with him. He says that he will join us as we go to speak to her, as she might even go easier on him if we're there. Vigo essentially only cares about himself. We find the Reverend Mother inside as she is arranging the redeployment of soldiers into the mine. She says that we must be worthy of a blessing before we can be given one. We will have to make a pilgrimage to the Alabaster Monastery to cleanse our spirit. Vigo tells us that there is a shrine to the west that bears a relic. It takes on your sin, weighing you down. It will cleanse you in the process which prepares you to stand before the Father for judgment. He says that he will not take part as he doesn't believe that he would survive such a journey. We find the relic and complete the pilgrimage succeeding in our atonement. Vigo skipped to the final altar as he is attempting to pray for the very first time. He is feeling guilty for taking the bribe that led to the death of his men. He questions the type of man that he is. He tells us that we're about to meet Inarius himself and that not everybody comes back from the meeting. Like the guy's Scarface or something. We enter the Hall of Ascension and we can find a mural on the wall that shows Inarius healing a woman that has been plagued with sickness since childhood, giving her a new life. It turns out that that woman is Reverend Mother Prava. We head into the main room and we can see a giant mural of Anarius on the wall, as the real Anarius begins to levitate down towards us. He asks us what we want, and we tell him that we need to traverse the Black Lake but cannot do so without his blessing. He mentions that one thing that he has learned during his time in Sanctuary is what we're looking for and what we need are very rarely the same thing. He once thought that he could find an end to the war, but has never found a resolution, instead only more pain. Everything that he has done has pulled him further from the home in the heavens. He says how the world they made was born from the impossible, but much like its creators, it rots from the inside. We say that Lilith has entered the ancient city, and with his blessing we can pursue her. This really pisses off Anarius. He calls humankind weak, and that the world has been wasted on the crusades of the unworthy. We tell him that we can stop her. He says that the audience has now concluded and that we're forced to leave. We head back to the Reverend Mother and ask why Anaris is in the sanctuary. She says that it's due to penitence, that the heavens cast him down for creating humanity as it was seen as a sin. He now seeks redemption and a chance to go home. It's prophesied that slaying Lilith is that chance. Anarius believes that the prophecy describes a spear of light piercing hatred's heart. He will begin with Lilith and then move on to the prime deities concluding the eternal conflict. We also ask about Vigo and she says that he will do his penance. We mention that our talks with Anarius didn't go all that great and she tells us that the fact that we even came back unscathed is approval enough and she gives us our blessing. We head out to find Nero in the woods and we end up in a strange place filled with phantoms. We can find a wolf that tells us that we're stuck in an illusion created by the Herodrum. It shows us a portal that will lead us through the trap taking us to a vision of Tristram. It looks quite a bit different than Diablo 3. We ask the wolf who they are, and he says that he is an admirer, that he saved us in the mountains in the cave during the blizzard. We would have frozen to death if not for him. He is the demonic wolf that we saw. We ask him why he saved us, and he says that we want to stop Lilith, and he wants us to succeed on our mission, but tells us that we will never succeed if we follow the Herodrum that the Herodrum will stumble and we shouldn't be there when they do. He explains that this is Tristram, the Herodrum of the imprisoned Diablo, the Lord of Terror, beneath the earth. They built this town nearby and as you can see it didn't go all that well. He also tells us that he knows that we were fed Lilith's blood and asks if we feel ourselves changing yet. With Lilith walking in our world it's only a matter of time. We continue through the portal to Nairal and she is standing inside of the old Herodric vault. She says that we are looking for a book that contains a spell to help us cross the Black Lake. We find the book, and Nairel mentions that a ledger was written by the Herodrum, chronicling spells that were created by Rothma. 
that Rothma's necromancy spells could bring her mother back since she is the only one that knows the ritual to cross the Black Lake. We make it back to the mine and Nayral begins to cast the spell on her mother's body, causing her mother's soul to re-enter her body. Nayral tells her mother that she will find a way to save her and Vinard responds that she cannot be saved from her own mistakes, reiterating that this body is only a husk and Nayral must allow her spirit to pass on, but will help her one last time by finishing the ritual. Our blessed blood is the final key and we're able to continue into the lair. We find remnants of Rothma, as he tells us that we are in fact the last visitor to the sanctum and that we've come too late just like Lilith before us. He reveals that his father Anarius was actually the first to arrive and that it unfolded just like his visions. He says how his visions began in dreams, images of an end of sanctuary. A great serpent carried these visions. His own thoughts melded with the serpents and the future was mended together. From this, he created the prophecy. This prophecy became his burden. He knew Anarius would be driven to interfere, believing that it was about him since he saw himself as the savior, piercing hatred's heart in hell. So Rothma locked the gates to hell and when Anarius found out, he would come demanding the key. We now see a glimpse of Anarius meeting with Rothma. He is mad at Rothma for standing in the way of the savior that the holy blood in his veins should be boiling. Rothma mentions that nothing Anarius does will change the future that he saw, but Anarius mentions that he creates his own destiny. As we reach the final levels of the passage, we come across a demon that was left here by Lilith. It's a tough fight, and we are joined by a knight, Penitent, who helps us survive the fight. When the fight is over, he collapses in front of us as we begin to open up the armor. Inside is Vigo, serving his penance for his sins by helping us on our journey. He asks if Nero is safe and asks us to give Vinard's charm back to her daughter, claiming that he should never have taken it. As he is dying, he mentions how it's so dark, wondering if he was too late even though he repented. We tell him that the light has come to carry him home and if he can see it. He looks over and says that he can and that they have come to claim him before finally dying. We get another scene of Anarius telling Rothma to hand over the key. Rothma says that he saw a vision of the key being lifted from his corpse under the eyes of the watchful serpent in his sanctum. We go into the sanctum and find the corpse of Rothmer on the stairs. We reach him and get a vision. We see Lilith entering the tomb, back when we found Vinard before. We can see Rothmer has been killed by a spear, to the heart by Anarius. Lilith mourns her son, and breaks the spear revealing the key to hell, showing that the very thing that Anarius sought was inside the spear that he used to kill his own son. She says that the key unlocks the path to the future, and that it was only made possible due to Rathma's sacrifice. And that sacrifice will not be in vain. We leave and return to Nairal, and we tell her about Vigo, and return the charm. We also explain what we saw in the sanctum. We get more narration from Lorath. He explains that this young girl was seeking her mother, seeking hope, but found neither. He goes on to say that her part in this story is far from over. In fact, we would need her much more than she needs us, despite not realizing this at the time. After leaving Nairal, our first course of action is in search of a man by the name of Donan, a member of the Herodrum and an old friend of Lorath who could help us in our fight against Lilith. We arrive at his estate in Eldheim as Donan is having a discussion with his son Yorin. Yorin is asking his father to allow him to go out into the field with the other knights, but Donan would rather his son stay with him and study his old Herodrum tomes instead. We interrupt and mention that Lorath has sent us with a warning that an ancient evil walks the land, the demon Lilith. This garners Donan's attention as he asks how we came to have this information, but is quickly interjected by his son. He mentions that this could have something to do with what Donan saw. Donan describes an incident at his estate and asks us to meet him there to discuss the details before telling his son Yorin that he has his permission to go and meet with the other knights telling him to be careful. When asked about Lorath, Donan describes him as a brother of the Herodrum, possibly the closest thing to a friend that Lorath has these days. When asked about the incident, he mentions that it occurred a few days prior, during the dead of night. At first he thought it was just a nightmare, but unfortunately it turned out not to be the case. Some very interesting information can also be heard here, as Donan admits that it was actually him that took Rothma's prophecy to Anarius stating that he could never have imagined that Anarius would kill his own son over it, stating that the key is now in Lilith's hands, before saying that it must relate to her search for Astaroth. We head out and reach Donan's estate, 
where we can find more blood petals within his study. Upon touching them, we get another vision. Donan is seen studying late at night as a whole ass portal appears in the middle of his study, whispers coming from it telling him to grant them entrance. Now, I must say, why the hell would you approach this thing? I mean, I would be doing cartwheels through the goddamn window if that were to happen to me. Donan stupidly enters the entrance, revealing Lilith in all her evil glory. He is understandably shocked, but I mean, what the hell were you expecting from a hell portal, Mickey Mouse? He mentions that he knows who she is, while Lilith repays the favor by saying the same, calling him old, tired, each day a struggle to live up to his own legacy. He asks Lilith what she wants with him and she responds, Astaroth. He tells her that he is dead, but she reaffirms that Astaroth cannot die, at least not by Donan's hands. I will admit, you could mistake this scene as going somewhere much less PG, but I can assure you, Donan's in some real trouble. She asks Donan what he did with him, but Donan orders her away, denying her permission. She mentions that he has grown frail in his older age, and offers to make him the hero he once was, before looking at the painting behind him, showing Donan with two other individuals. Lilith leaves moments after seeing the painting, while Donan continues to banish her. The cut on his lip is still bleeding, showing that it wasn't a dream. As we leave the estate, we're ambushed by local goat men. Donan mentions that they've never actually dared to come this close to the estate before. We mention that it's likely Lilith's presence, drawing them in before mentioning the vision that we had in his study. He is distraught that the Daughter of Hatred was in his own home, worried that she might be furious that he cast her out. We ask who the other people in the painting are since Lilith's unusual fascination with it. He says that they are the druids Nefane and Erida, who helped him slay Astaroth, before realizing that it's actually quite likely that since he resisted Lilith, she could question them about the demon next. He mentions that there are knights stationed among the nearby villages, and that they would have seen Lilith if she were to pass through, mentioning that we should go and ask them. We do however ask Donan about his relationship with Erida and Nefane and can quickly realize that they have become estranged with time. Erida is now consumed with her task of watching over the dead, leaving Donan to wish that they could sit and discuss histories like they once did. While Nefane refuses to meet with Donan, angry that he has given up land to the knight's penitent, calling him bitter, now living as a recluse and deep inside the woods. We ask why Lilith seems to believe that Astaroth is alive. Donan says that demons are arrogant creatures. They could never accept the idea that a mortal could vanquish someone like Astaroth. What concerns him is why she is looking for him, stating that the fact that Astaroth came from the realm of hatred, the same place that Lilith once called home, is possibly the answer. We travel to the nearby town of Braystag, the same place that Yorin is visiting, and speak to the chieftain. She tells us that there is a fog uphill, where mad spirits are emerging and killing nearby people. We mention that we're looking for a demon that is passing through, and the chieftain confirms that they have seen her, saying that the demon went uphill to Erida's domain. Yorin offers to guide us to Erida since he knows the way from his father. This leads us to a sealed door that Yorin is able to open using druidic language. We ask Yorin if his mother was a druid, which he denies, saying that his mother was more of a scholar, and since she died when he was young, he has learnt most of what he knows of his mother from her writings. We find an allergy for the people that died fighting Astaroth, created by Erida. It has been corrupted as the Guardians begin to attack us. We come to the realization that they are now under the influence of Lilith, which is strange since they should only be able to be influenced by Erida. We find a tomb further inside and can find runes that Yorin identifies as the work of Erida, confirming that the corruption within was not caused by Lilith, but instead Erida herself. We reach the village on the other side and speak to a local named Arlo. He says that Erida came through with a horned woman, heading towards the top of the hill, the sound of Erida's tail harper causing the madness to begin. We reach the top of the hill and can find Erida sitting at the top. She mentions that only one of us will walk away from this, asking us to enjoy the storm for a moment. We mention that the dead that she controls are now killing her people. Erida mentions that some people will die, but that is the way of nature, that it's a crucible, it devours the weak and makes the strong stronger believing that whoever survives will save the land from hell. We point out that she has fallen for Lilith's lies, but she believes that it was her own choice. Lilith simply gave her the ability to do what must be done. We ask her what she gave her in return for that ability, but she says that all knowledge must be earned. We have a big old fight and manage to defeat Erida. She quickly comes to terms with the loss, saying that the stronger prevails. 
We once again ask what she gave to Lilith, and she responds that she told her of the wards around Ashtaroth's prison and how to break them, stating that her people have forgotten what it took to defeat Ashtaroth and that they must learn again. If they cannot kill Ashtaroth, then how could they possibly stand against the full might of hell? We waste no time and head out towards Boglin, Nefane's domain. We can find a stone that welcomes travelers to the forest where they can become one with nature. Very typical of a nature reserve, that sort of thing. However, written over the message is the saying, Cathedral dogs not welcome. A little less typical of a nature reserve, but we progress. A nearby wolf leads us to Nefane, and let's just say that my dude is not doing very well, god damn. You could say he is half the man that he once was. He gives us a sniff and says that we stink like Donan, before calling him a coward for not coming himself. He mentions that Lilith did this to him, but he is beyond saving asking us to find the demon, that she is to the north and is planning something. When we arrive we can find glimpses of Lilith performing some form of ritual. It turns out to be the summoning of an amalgam of rage using the blood of Nefane. We manage to wound the creature, but it flees before we can land the killing blow. We return to Nefane and tell him what we found. He mentions that it's his own fault, that he made a pact with Lilith to help destroy the knight's penitent and return for the location of where Ashtaroth is hidden, Eldheim. He mentions that in her presence he lost control, that rage consumed him. He asks us to end the corruption, so we drive a big old spear into his chest. And look, I'm not going to get into the fact that how the hell this guy survived for hours hung to a tree like a Christmas ornament, cut in half, might I add, but dies to a little stick to the chest. But you know, whatever, let's continue. When we arrive at Aldheim, the place has been overrun by Goatmen. The nearby commander of the Knight's Penitent mentions that the Horned Woman and her beast came through here. Nothing could stop them, not even their prayers, stating that the light has forsaken this place. We find Donan inside, and he mentions that Lilith could have killed him too, but she intentionally left him untouched, instead toying with him, wanting him to watch her destroy everything that he's built. He asks if we've seen Yorin when we came into Eldheim. We tell him that we didn't, and he says that there is still a way to stop her, but he can't do it alone. He says that Lilith is in an old chamber beneath the keep, the place where Ashtaroth is. He admits that he didn't kill him as the stories say, instead imprisoning him in a soul stone as a last resort, building Eldheim over the stone to contain the evil. He goes on to say that he has spent his life watching over it, keeping it a secret so Ashtaroth would never hurt anyone again. Not even his son knows. He apologizes for hiding this from us, but mentions that he couldn't risk a stranger knowing the truth. As we head towards the chamber, we can find bodies of the knight's penitent members that were escorting Yorin, even finding his mace on top of one of the knight's bodies. We ask Donan if she could possibly have taken Yorin somewhere. He begins to panic, asking what possible reason she would have since Yorin means nothing to her. We reach the chamber that contained Ashtaroth and can find more blood petals on the ground. It's vision time. We can see Lilith holding a soul stone as she mentions that the mighty Ashtaroth, the charred duke himself, badass name by the way, is now confined to a cage. Ashtaroth recognizes Lilith as she offers him a deal. Ashtaroth provides safe passage to a place she is no longer welcome and in return for his freedom and more. Offering Donan's son, his pride and joy is a way for Ashtaroth to enact retribution on Donan for imprisoning him but only if he gives Lilith what she wants. He agrees, and Lilith stabs the soul stone into Yorin's head before the vision ends. We tell Donan what we saw, and he becomes distressed. He says that there is still time. He says that he has spent half of his life studying the soul stone, and that he knows its true nature. It will take time for Ashtaroth to overpower Yorin, and since he's taught his son well, he will be resisting the demon's influence. He mentions that the nearby Karagor is a likely location for Ashtaroth, since he wouldn't be able to resist all of the innocent lives. We arrive as blood petals begin falling from the skies above. Lilith speaking to Donan, mentioning that Yorin has been waiting for him. We can see that Yorin is not looking very human anymore. Ashtaroth tells Donan that he called out for him, wept until his tears became fire. Lilith tells Ashtaroth to do as he pleases, since she already has what she came for. We are left to fight Ashtaroth and the giant demon dog that was creating using Nefane's blood. After a long fight, we do come out ahead. Donan approaches the body, removing the soul stone from his head, reverting Yorin back to his old self, but unfortunately, he is dead. Donan apologizes to his son as he mourns him. Lorith once again narrates the scene, mentioning that Lilith and Ashtaroth have made a deal. 
but we're the ones that paid the cost. That our presence was no coincidence. Everything happened exactly as Lilith wanted. We just danced to her music. He mentions that Donan is shattered, his mind in grief, not her or answers. Nobody knew what Lilith was after or exactly what Ashtaroth had promised her, but we needed to recover and stop chasing phantoms. After leaving Donan to grieve, it's time for us to head to Ked Bardu in search of Lorith Nar and be updated on his search for Elias. When we do actually find him, however, it's a bit of a sorry sight. Two men are having discussions about what they should do with him, as Lorith is sleeping in the mud. We ask the men what Lorith has been up to in town, and they mention that he came into town days ago, asking for a servant of the demon Lilith. A pale man, and it seems that he didn't like what he found. We tell them that he is a friend of ours, and that we will take care of it from here. One lovely midnight bath later, and Lorith is now with the Land of the Living once again. It turns out that Lorith has been a little too friendly with the bottle, and we ask him what happened to him. He mentions that he got beaten by alcohol, and also had a brawl with the town's goat over a patch of mud. Nice. We ask him what he has learnt of the Pale Man. He mentions that the Pale Man was once Herodrum, saying that his name is Elias, Lorith's former apprentice, and since his former apprentice was responsible for bringing Lilith back to Sanctuary, he didn't take the news very well. He says that they need to figure out what he has done and then kill him, before asking us to find a woman that has some messages. And since he is probably over the alcohol limit to even exist at this point, we should probably go and see her. We ask around for the mysterious woman and find out that the Pale Man passed through the Abaru Canyon some time ago. We head back to Lorath and let him know, and he mentions that he wrote to the Orbe Monastery the day that he arrived, but they haven't replied yet, even when they should have. He mentions that the scholars have devoted their lives to studying forbidden knowledge, believing that to serve the light we must know the darkness, so silence is unsettling. We head out with Lorath to the canyons in search of Elias. We find a camp filled with dead merchants that were slain by demons, so we now know that we're getting closer. There are more demons around the surrounding buildings, but Lorath points out that the demons summoned were nothing but vermin and that he would expect something much more from a mage of Elias's ability. We find the home of a local stone carver and can find out that this carver is doing a hell of a lot more than just cutting stones. A book on his desk tells us that Elias met with the stone carver, saying that the pain of a lonely man who had only ever learnt to hate the world, yet Lilith found him beautiful, and he wants to help her build a new world. We now realise that Genbar the stone carver was actually the summoner that brought the demons to the village, hence why the demons were of such low strength. Using a secret back path from the house, we follow it to find Gembar in a cave, doing all types of evil shenanigans. Initially, he thinks that we are sent by Elias, which Lorith attempts to play along with, saying that we're on a very important mission, that we have something for the master, asking where he is. Gembar is, however, much smarter than he looks and sees straight through our deception deciding to summon some more D-tier demons to attack us. We eventually wound him and he calls out to Elias. Surprisingly, he responds. He mentions Lorith Nah, saying that he has waited a very long time for this. In all honesty, it was really giving me some real like Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader parallels. He summons a demon to fight us and this time, it packs some serious heat. Once defeated, Lorith mentions that the bad news is the fact that Gemba was expecting somebody, which means that Elias has most likely turned a lot of other people to madness. But the good news is that we can use his little demon gift since the demon that he sent us is actually quite unique. It requires constant feeding of humans to survive. So if we cut open its belly, somebody inside might just hold a clue of where it actually came from. Lorith ships the demon body to Kid Bardu, while we take some time to go and check up on the Orbe Monastery. When we arrive, our protagonist mentions that the monastery reeks of forbidden spells, meaning that it's likely been taken over. We can find a raving monk on the ground that is having a very crappy day. He says that the abbot opened the door, and the pale man smiled, before taking the forbidden knowledge. We reach the main door and can find the abbot sitting among his books, as the library burns around him saying that Elias told him that the ruin of Sanctuary was imminent, and that only he could help. Elias plans to summon a lesser evil, taking all the books and scrolls needed to perform such a ritual, and murdering the scholars in the process, 
the souls of those scholars come back and completely wreck the abbot. We return to Lorath and inform him of the situation at the monastery. The fact that Elias could summon a lesser evil terrifies him, asking which one of them he actually intends to summon, mentioning that while Elias could paint the steps in blood, a lesser evil could wipe out the continent. When pressed on the lesser evils, Lorath explains that there are the prime evils, Mephisto, Baal, and Diablo. The lessers are their rotten kin, Esmodan, Belial, and Dariel and Duriel. Each of them have ravaged humankind since the dawn of history, and they are more than happy to do it again. We head inside the tent and Lorath begins digging inside our old little demon friend. He finds a medallion that bears the crest of the ruler of the royal house of Gulran, giving us a clue to Elias' whereabouts. After a very long journey, we arrive at Gilran. Lorath believes that Elias will be in the palace, behind the high walls and gates, saying that we will have to find another way into the palace. The woman accompanying him mentions that there is somebody that actually knows how to get into the palace, and that Lorath knows who they are but still refuses to answer her messages about her missing friend Oyun, stating that she might be the only person left that actually knows how to navigate the underground tunnels. Lorath isn't convinced that Oyun is even alive, or if the tunnels even exist. He believes that there is another reason that Zolaya is seeking Oyun, which she refuses to answer. We instead ask Zolaya if we could take a look for her, asking for any details that could help us find her. She mentions that she owns a house in the market square, that they were meant to meet there before she couldn't get close. Lorith doesn't believe what we're doing is worth the risk, but hopes that we can prove him wrong. We enter the city, fighting demons and cannibals throughout the streets. We reach the house and save a nearby villager that mentions that the cannibals are rounding everyone up, killing and feasting. But there are a few that they drag away into some prisons. We hope the fact that the cannibals are using prisons could mean that Oyun lives. Many charred cannibals later and we do find that prison, containing Oyun. She is obviously distraught by the fact that she was about to be somebody's lunch, but we reassure her by saying that Zolaya sent us. We tell her that we need to head back to the market, but she insists that there is a safer way out, using an old prison wing that was sealed off years ago from an earthquake. Now, I'm no structural engineer, but I think Oyun really needs to redefine her meaning of safe. Turns out, the old wing is completely packed with zombies, so not so safe at all. We reach the outside and reunite with Lorith and Zolaya which ends up bringing a tear to Lorath's eyes. He praises us for our good deed for the day, and we ask about the hidden tunnel to the palace. Oyun tells us that there is an old escape tunnel near the caverns nearby, so we waste no time and we head right there. Lorath mentions that when we first met him, he had assumed that the connection between us and Lilith would lead us to darkness, as it did for Elias. But after seeing the good that we are doing, he admits that he may have been wrong. Near the cavern entrance, Lorath says that while we were in the city, he was thinking about which lesser evil Elias intends to summon, believing that what he did to Gulran is a clue. We mentioned that he drowned the city in blood, which Lorath thinks narrows his goal to likely summon either Duriel or Andariel. Duriel feeds off physical pain, while Andariel revels in mental and emotional torment of people. But the fact remains that regardless of which of the two he chooses to summon, the fate of Gulran will be shared by many more cities to come. We come across the cannibals and Cultus. The big guy is named Brol. He is asking why they are staying here as he needs more prey and meat. The cultists reassure him that he will have exactly that once Elias finishes his grand work, saying that the seeds they have sown will bear fruit and Gulran will be reborn. Brol, on the other hand, is a much simpler man and just wants to skip to the buffet menu. The other cultist, bravely, mentions that Elias is trying to summon Andariel into the world, and that her power will help him get more meat, an offer that Brawl approves of much more, even asking to watch the ritual. We find the personal library of Elias, and find out some interesting things regarding his time in the Herodrum. Elias believed that he could use the power of the prime evils against them, fighting fire with fire essentially, Lorith gives him an ultimatum, stop or leave the Herodrum. You can probably guess which one he chooses. We reach a place named the Forsaken Ascent. It's a complete hellhole, literally. And Lorith mentions that the Triune are reclaiming their ancient temple. 
However, it's not as easy as just walking inside. Elias was researching something about the shrines to Mephisto, Baal, and Diablo, the three prime evils. And unfortunately, only the blessed can open the way, which means that if you want to enter the ancient temple, you will need to be personally blessed by a prime evil. Lorith believes it to be incredibly risky, but we have little choice. The first statue that we visit is Baal, the Lord of Destruction. His influence has launched every war in history, never once tiring of conflict. In order for this to work, we must speak his true name, Tor Baelos. We get hit with what I can only describe as a demon fart and fall over. We recover and continue to the next shrine. The next is the shrine of Diablo, Lord of Terror. Every mortal fear, every nightmare, he is the root of it all. Once again, by speaking his true name, El Diabolos. The third and final shrine belongs to the Lord of Hatred, Mephisto, the father of Lilith. This one in particular will be a little dicey, since we technically have Lilith's blood inside of us. We get a little touchy with Lorath as we tell him that we can handle it. He points out that the power here is already agitating us. We tell him again that we can handle it, and ask him what Mephisto's true name is. Dul Mephistos. Lorath leaves to search for the temple, while instead of a demon fart, a portal opens up nearby. Revealing that the bloodied wolf that saved us from the blizzard in Act 1 and helped us in the Herodrum puzzle, it turns out that this wolf is actually the prime evil Mephisto, Lord of Hatred. He insists that we can help each other, saying that the mortal Elias seeks to use the power of the primes for his own ends, mentioning that nobody knows their place anymore. His meddling has drawn echoes of the past to his refuge of hatred, but they seem to be out of order, before asking us to help put them back in order, and in return he will grant us his blessing. We find ourselves at some form of barbarian village as they yell out that they would never fall to a prime evil. In this particular circumstance, we are actually fighting on the side of the prime evils, against the innocent. When we reach the end and rid the village of all of his occupants, Mephisto praises us, saying that we were born for this. We have a quick jab back by saying that we didn't expect the prime evil to require the help of a mortal. He admits that he has had some bad luck in recent years, being trapped in one of those soulstone trinkets cast back to hell, saying that his essence is reforming, so his power has limits. We state that he deserves far worse. Mephisto explains that he has done nothing but offer us help, and yet we repay him with hatred, asking us to instead focus that anger on Lilith, thus granting us his blessing before telling us to destroy her and save our world. When asked briefly about the barbarians that we just slew, he says that they are actually in fact the victims of his brother, Baal. He laid waste to the barbarian lands long before our time, stating that he wished to have seen it with his own eyes, but he had no part in it and Elias has upset the balance at the Temple of the Primes, stating that the shades of the past belong in Baal's domain, not his, but he does welcome their hatred. We meet up with Lorith to inform him of our talks with Mephisto, and we tell him that it's not the first time that we've actually spoken to him. This annoys Lorith, asking why we have kept it from him. We are definitely acting a little cranky at this stage as we respond that we all just have our secrets. We find Elias performing the ritual, and Lorith asks us to stay in the shadows, stating that he will handle it himself. We can see a woman on the stone as Elias is in the process of tattooing symbols into her neck. Blood levitates above, with Brol ordering a nearby cultist to add his blood to the rest, shall we say. Lorith interrupts Elias, and straight up stabs him in the chest. The blood begins to fall over the woman as she awakes distraught. Brol, on the other hand, isn't happy that his extra serving of meat is running out of the restaurant. We give our compliments to the chef and leave. The woman is confused about what happened, before mentioning that it feels like fire is crawling all over her skin. She says that she can hear something, a voice in her head. Lorith confirms that the voice is likely that of the lesser evil and Dariel, since a connection has been made between the two of them. I I'm telling you, I have seen horror films. Voices of a powerful entity in the heads of a mortal I know how this ends, it's a bit harsh, but I think we just need to, you know, cut our losses if you know what I'm saying. The woman's name is Thaisa, and she believes that Elias fled to his refuge, since he disappeared after being stabbed. We leave for Tarsaric, since the locals there know the deserts well, and some may have even heard of this palace that Elias uses as a refuge. 
Thaisa is having a hard time with the voices in her head and tells us to ask around for somebody to guide us through the desert, while Lorith helps to find her something to clear her mind. We speak to some woman that recommends an old man that might just be crazy enough to take us out towards that evil sorcerer. We find that old man at a nearby riverbank, and it's definitely safe to say that he lives up to the reputation of being crazy. He is very drunk, but recognizes the Herodrum symbol around Loris' neck. He yells out the name Deckard Cain, calling him an old friend, believing Lorith to actually be him. If you've played Diablo 3, you'll probably know who that is. Lorith tells him that Deckard is long gone, and his name is Lorith, asking him to help us pass through the sandstorm. He agrees. One whole Blizzard Escort quest later of Meshif reliving his greatest hits with Deckard, we finally arrive. Lorith asks Meshif to stay outside while we go in, stating that the danger is lurking here. We trick a noble into thinking that we're recruits, as he explains that Lilith has just blessed us with her presence, describing it as magnificent, and that even Master Elias might give us a glimpse of her through the sightless eye. We manage to make it to Elias' chamber, and end up battling him only for him to disappear once again. Some blood petals on the floor catch our attention, and we enter another vision. We see a monk literally getting eaten alive by wolves. This crap was brutal, and I will not be showing it since YouTube. But Lilith and Elias are having a jovial conversation while watching the, um, the show. Lilith mentions that the three prime evils, Mephisto, Diablo, and Bale, stating that the ruin of Sanctuary is imminent. Yet Elias still doubts it. He believes that we will be saved by Lilith's hand, stating that she has not come to save, but instead in power. That in her shadow the strong will oppose the might of hell itself. Let the weak fend for themselves. Elias states that Andariel lives and Herodrum will now die. Lorith now understands that the reason that Elias and Lilith are gathering followers is due to the fact that they are building an army to fight against Hell and the Prime Evils. Elias re-enters the chamber and states that the Lords of Hell threaten our existence, and that he is just doing something about it, and that Lorath will never understand what he has done for this world. We play cat and mouse with him again, and he disappears after we beat him in combat. We're only left with one thing, and that is to find the Sightless Eye. After fighting the greatest magician to ever live a few more times, we manage to get our hands on that Sightless Eye said to possess the power to look into any event regardless of time. We head back outside and find Meshif, stabbed and dying. He was ambushed from behind and after taking his final swig of alcohol, he dies. We return to Thaisa and Lorith swears to study the sightless eye and use it against Elias and Lilith. Thaisa feels that she underestimated Elias, but Lorith is just happy to have the sightless eye, believing that Elias was using it to communicate with Lilith from far distances. We get some more narration from Lorath as he mentions that the prime evils were reforming. Hell is on its way, but Elias was not the answer to people's prayers. Before dropping some words of wisdom, if you want to take the measure of somebody, judge them by their deeds, not their words. Elias preached about saving the world while standing on a pile of corpses. The Wanderer was everything that he was not, tainted by Lilith's blood yet able to resist her corruption. That is what he witnessed in the Wanderer's deed. And only at that moment did he feel that together they could actually keep the evils at bay. We find ourselves back at the Forsaken Chapel and ask Thaisa how she's feeling. She mentions that she can cut out Andariel's whispers most of the time, but not always. Lorath believes that some whispers are a much better alternative than having her walk the world again. He wonders how Andariel fits into Lilith and Elias' plans before asking to go over what we know thus far. We mention her deal with Astaroth, to which Lorith finds an interesting choice of an ally, since Astaroth served her father Mephisto. Not to mention that she currently possesses a key to hell, a place where she is seen as a traitor. So why would she want to go? Lorith is concerned that Lilith might already be in hell, believing that we should use the Sightless Eye to help us since Elias was using it to contact Lilith. We use the Sightless Eye to see the current location of Lilith and Elias, as they are in the midst of a conversation. Lilith mentions that her father's essence is reforming. Elias asks how she can tell, to which she responds that she feels like a thousand old wounds are being ripped open again. He is still weak, however, vulnerable. Lilith plans to strike before he can resist. It's not long after this that Lilith senses something, narrowing in on our gaze. We mention to Lorith that she saw us, 
and he says that it's only a matter of time now before she comes for us. We, however, think otherwise, mentioning that her current objective seems to be focused more on her father Mephisto, since she is trying to take his power while he is still weak. Lorath begins to think of a solution before coming to a realization, mentioning that if she manages to take Mephisto's power, she will become like a prime evil herself, being able to conquer hell and sanctuary alike, and he now has an idea of how to stop her. He gives us a letter and mentions that we need the help of an old ally, Donan, saying that he would have gone to Kyovashad for guidance after the loss of his son. We pose the question to Lorath that if Lilith were to take Mephisto's power, could it possibly help Sanctuary in the long run? He acknowledges that it would strike a massive blow against Hell, but it would unlikely be for our benefit, since all of her actions are also led by hatred. We ask Thaisa what she knows of Andariel. She mentions that she knows more about her than she would like to, describing her pain as primal and wordless. Once a part of something more, but Andariel doesn't like her to think about it. We head to Kyovashad and find Donan in the cathedral. We tell him that we have a letter for him and he hopes that it's of good news for once. When we mention that it's from Lorath, eh, let's just say the man is not quite as enthused. He reads the letter, written in Herodrum code. We ask him what it says and he is not surprised that Lorath didn't tell us since that would require a basic degree of consideration. Lorath wishes to imprison Lilith within Donan's soul stone, the same one that held Astaroth. He believes that it cannot work, at least not at the moment since the soul stone would need to be attuned to Lilith first, and for that, we would need an expert. We mentioned that Lorith was hoping that Donan would be that expert. Donan replies that Lorith is even more foolish than he thought if he believed that. He asks us to go to the Herodric Vault, as he will dig up what he needs, and then once we deliver it all to Lorith, hopefully Lorith will leave him alone. We reach the vault, and Donan mentions that there is an intruder inside the vault. We just mention that she's simply a child. Donan thinks it's ridiculous for us to bring a child to the vault, but we correct him because in fact it was her that technically brought us here. Nero is practically drooling all over the Herodrum notes as we awaken her. Donan tells her off for swinging the staff around, claiming that it's not a toy, before mentioning that he once lived in this vault, and wants Nero to explain why she is here. She says that she is a student conducting research into the Herodrum. Donan asks if Lorath is her teacher. She says that she doesn't need one since Lilith threatens Sanctuary as we speak, and she will prepare for that with or without help. Donan scoffs at the remark, making fun of Nairal for thinking that she could stop Lilith before leaving to gather his notes. He does say, however, while walking, that he was once like Nairal, having more dreams than he knew what to do with. While Donan is collecting the notes, he mentions that the Soulstone magic is incredibly treacherous, even in the most skilled hands, and that since Lilith hails from her father's domain of hatred, that is the essence that will need to be attuned to the stone for it to work. Donan has kept a map of all the places that Mephisto's hatred still lingers, so we can go and collect it. He finds his old Herodrum amulet on the table and we ask about it. Donan mentions that he bets Lorath still wears his, since the Order's mission was his lifeblood. Donan, however, couldn't give up his life for it, not like Lorath. He wanted to be a man, have a family, chasing fellowship and glory, but all of it for nothing since the death of his son. He goes on to say that he can't do it, the soul stone won't work anyway with him, saying that the stuff that soul stones are made of is as old as the eternal conflict itself, with magic so primordial that you require faith and spirit, of which he has none. We reiterate that he is the only one that can help us, and he agrees that unfortunately we may be right, insisting that he can't make any promises for us but he will try for us and Lorath, agreeing to hear what he has to say. We return to Nairel as she is getting excited over some of the books that she's read within the vault. Donan and her bond over the books of Kalhar, calling her work masterpieces, and she brings up the fact that she wishes to join us on the journey back to Lorath. Since she now knows the Herodrum ways, their magic, and even the coding writing system that they use. And since Lilith took her mother, she will do whatever it takes to stop her. We asked Donan how many people have lived within the vault. He says that it was Elias, Lorath, and himself, joined by an angel, Tyriel. Nero asks if he is referring to an angel like Anarius, with Donan saying that Tyriel and Anarius are very different, fortunately. Tyriel set off before Elias did. He wasn't sure what drew him away, but he could tell that Tyriel was afraid. The Herodrum fell apart after that. When asked about soul stones, he mentions that they are like the Herodrum's greatest weapons, but 
also their greatest curse. There is nothing like it in existence. The very first Herodrum used a set of soul stones to contain Diablo, Mephisto and Baal. And that power comes at a cost, since the soul stone must always be guarded, it consumes your days and dreams, becoming a prisoner as much as the demon within the stone. And the evil inside the stone always finds a way out. But even with all of that being said, it is the best way that Donan can think of to contain a demon, wishing that he knew a better alternative. We head back to the campsite and find Thaisa outside, struggling. She is saying that Andariel was getting louder, screaming and laughing, unable to even tell the difference. She tried to push her down but needs some fresh air, some place to clear her mind and find a moment of quiet. We speak with Lorath and he reiterates the plan to capture Lilith in the stone before she can attempt to take Mephisto's power for herself. We mention that we don't have the time required to prepare the stone, so why not just fight her? He doubts our ability since we have her corrupted blood in our veins, but regardless, fighting her is kind of a last resort. Even if you could defeat her, she would eventually come back. But with the stone, it wouldn't be an issue. Donan points out that soul stones do eventually fail. Given enough time, but Lorath believes that Donan will find a way. A sandstorm begins outside and Nayral realizes that she cannot see Thaisa anymore and runs out to check on her. Once outside, we find out that her moment of fresh air has turned into a bit more of a dangerous situation. As Elias has now captured her, he says that our fumbling with the eye has led him straight to our camp. He mentions that the runes inked into Thaisa's skin form a waypoint. She is a beacon across realms. He levitates her over the symbol that formed on the ground, almost like a key for a lock, stating that her part is now done, and so is ours since we won't be around much longer. It turns out that the Maiden of Anguish, Andariel, is back in all of her nightmarish glory. We hold off the lesser evil, causing her to burn to a crisp. We head back inside and notify Lorath and Donan of what happened. Thaisa mentions that before Elias went to the steps, he went to Hawazar, taking something that wasn't his. It is why she was hunting him, mentioning that she has a friend in Hawazar that has mastered the art of immortality. Yeah, uh, you know, I think that that might just come in handy. She offers to take us to her, as she could know his secret. Lorith praises us, saying that the fact that we stood against a lesser evil and lived is no normal feat. We get some more narration from Lorath, wondering what Deckard Cain would have written in his chronicles if he had seen us. Two old friends and new allies that were eager to learn from our vast knowledge, bound against the darkness like the Herodrum of old. Lorath believes that Lilith's plan all along was to take Mephisto's power. Not to save humanity, but to simply rule over hell itself. But Elias was too blind to see it. We meet back up with Thaisa, Lorath, and Nairel, and we quickly learn that Thaisa pretended to study under Elias, as she found it useful while she was hunting him. We ask how we're meant to defeat Elias, since he doesn't die. Thaisa says that we need to break a hold on his immortality, a logical solution to the whole not dying aspect if you ask me. Lorath believes that killing Elias will serve a massive blow against Lilith and would greatly improve our chances of success against her. Thaisa says that we need to seek out Timuay in the marshes. She traded with the power in the swamp and received a long life for it. She might have the answer to kill Elias once and for all. Nero and Lorath will head to the swamps in search of answers on how to deal with Elias' immortality, while Donan and Thaisa will imbue the soul stone. We must help each of them. We begin with Donan and meet up with him. He intends to head towards the keep in Zakaroom. Apparently it holds a strong presence of hatred there. Hopefully we'll be able to use that to prepare the soul stone trap for Lilith. Once inside, Donan mentions that the place feels like it's surrounded by otherworldly magic. Donan begins casting the spell to gather the hatred, but his problem. He begins getting really angry with himself, calling himself an old fool. He begins to realize that it's actually a lot worse than he thought. It must have been damaged when Astaroth took over Yorin. He will now need to repair it, requiring numerous materials and tools that we will need to go and collect. We head to a local village in search of the items required to fix the soul stone, but Donan mentions that this tiny little village in the middle of the swamp doesn't have what they need. Call me surprised. Donan yells at the shopkeeper, saying that he can feel the strange magic in the swamp, and where there is magic, there are users of magic. She directs us to a nearby witch to help us out. Which, when we arrive, the witch is Thaisa. We ask her to help us with the soul stone, but she feels that it's not her responsibility, saying that the soul stone is about Lilith, not Elias, so it doesn't concern her. 
Donan asked her for the tools and the ingredients, but since we helped her survive Andariel's summoning, she will lend us her tools as repayment. However, for the ingredient Quicksilver, we will need to visit another witch named Valtha. We asked Taisa why she returned here to the swamp, mentioning that since we plan to make Elias mortal, she is here to collect his debt. We asked Donan about his feelings towards repairing the Soul Stone, and he reminds us that the Herodrum have studied the Soul Stone for generations, and for him personally, more than 20 years. But there are not enough books in Sanctuary to contain what we don't know about it. It will take a miracle to work, but points out that it's what we expect of him. We journey through the dangerous swamp and arrive at Valthar's hovel. We tell her that Thaisa has sent us, and she tells us that she unknowingly just sent us to our death, saying that the pursuit of Elias is foolish and that only Lilith is our future. We have to fight her and manage to come out on top, taking what we needed and heading back to Donan and Thaisa. We tell Thaisa that we just met with Valtha, and she asks how her sister was. We tell her not so good after what we just did, since she chose Lilith over their friendship and allowed Elias to turn her. She can't believe it, saying that she would have known not to trust Elias. But we correct her in saying that it actually wasn't Elias that convinced her, but Lilith, finding her ideals convincing. Thaisa is devastated, saying that Valthar was her teacher. She guided her when she began her service. We begin the process to repair the soul stone, as Donan guides us in steps. It's quick to notice that Donan is very unsure of himself, not knowing how many times to stoke the fire, and briefly forgetting about the sulfur. When he attempts the spell to fix the soul stone, it fails. Donan begins losing his cool, stating that he told us that he isn't the man that we want or need. Thaisa takes us outside and mentions that Donan is not up to the task suspecting that he no longer trusts himself. While we cannot erase all of his doubt, his most recent grief is the death of his son, which is, however, something that we could deal with, but mentions that he probably won't like it. She tells Donan that she wants to take him to an old place of power in the swamp, saying that it will do him some good. We arrive at this rickety old fire hazard as Thaisa mentions that Valtha brought her to this place when she was young, a place where you can face your demons, whether it be fear or grief. Donan is hesitant, wanting to leave. Thaisa reminds him that nothing in this swamp is free, not even his magic, pointing out his lack of adventure, asking if it's buried in his youth. He will need to place an offering to the swamp. A necklace or a ring will suffice, as long as he holds it dear. We bring back some ingredients for the tea and give them to Thaisa. Once the tea is finished, down the hatch. It's essentially a big old trip out session. Imagine a bunch of people doing mushrooms all for the first time. Donan, in particular, is tripping the hell out, while Thaisa and us just sort of sleep it off. He hears the voice of his son, as a spectral vision of Yorin greets him. Donan pleads with him to come back, saying that he shouldn't have allowed him to leave the keep. But he does come to admit that Yorin was ready to leave. Yorin tells him that he's right, that he needs to go, and he needs to go again, before telling his father that he is ready. Donan breaks down mourning his son. A pretty rough high, if you ask me. We awake to a portal, the same one that Mephisto creates. When we enter, we can see a vision of Travancal, the place where Mephisto was once imprisoned and later turned into the Durants of Hate, his own personal lair. He arrives and tells us that he did warn us that the Herodrim would only hold us back, saying that they are so consumed by their emotions that they forget what really matters. Lilith is the true threat, not Elias. We mention that we know why he is so afraid of her since he is currently weak. He mentions that his fate is directly tied to ours. If Lilith devours Mephisto, Sanctuary is lost. He gives us an offer. He will open a portal out of the swamp, allowing the Herodrim to deal with Elias since it is their sin to bear, while we can work with Mephisto to stop Lilith. We tell him that we know who our real allies are, our friends. Very anime of us, I like it. Mephisto mentions that the Day of Reckoning will come and our true allies will be revealed. We tell him that the Herodrim are not the only ones planning on taking down Lilith. Mephisto laughs at this, saying that we shouldn't put our hope in Inarius, if that's who we mean, reminding us that Inarius was once his prisoner, and that he has seen Inarius' true face. He and Lilith are not as different as we might think. The angel was already filled with hate before he became Mephisto's prisoner. All he did was simply refine his anger, and now he has taken that new anger back with him to Sanctuary. We leave and arrive back at the tower with Thaisa and Donan. We ask Thaisa how Donan is dealing with his post-high, 
He apparently wandered around for hours after it wore off, but feels that a long journey through the swamp is a more rewarding one than a short one. She goes on to say that our journey was even longer, asking if we've faced our inner demons as Donan did. We tell her that we did, and hopefully for the last time. This time around helping Donan, you can quickly tell that he is much more sure of his decisions, missing no step. He begins his chant and turns into a goddamn master blacksmith, fixing the broken soul stone. We now leave to meet up with Nairao and Lorath in their search for clues to Elias' immortality. We meet up with him and find the hovel of Tim away. She states that only two kind of people come seeking her, those running from trouble or those running towards it. We asked if she had heard of Elias, which she denies. Nairao mentions that we believe that Elias has made a pact with the swamp to become immortal, saying that Thaisa told us to seek her out. At first she is upset, saying that only Thaisa would be cold enough to send a child out here to die. Lorath says that we have no intention of dying, while the woman very ominously states that one of us will. That is the way that it ends out here in the swamp, warning us to return home, and that she will not have a child's blood on her hands. Nairel mentions that she saw what happened with her mother, driven so mad by Lilith that it killed her. She is hardly a child anymore. Timoe accepts that and says that if Elias made a pact, it was likely with the Tree of Whispers. Apparently, she was once infected by the swamp's poison, and she herself made a pact with the tree out of fear. She now gives the tree knowledge in return for keeping her one step out of the grave, refusing to ever let go of her. We leave to find the tree and speak to Lorath about why he believes Elias sought immortality. He believes that the ritual to summon Lilith would be demanding, possibly believing that he couldn't survive it and used it as a precautionary measure. We use some incense on the altar that will apparently show us the part of the Tree of Whispers. We get our second trip session as we fall asleep in the middle of the swamp. Lorath briefly awakens to see... Oh, Jesus Christ. Hell no. I'll take a prime evil over that thing any day. We awake to find a giant nightmare snake crawling through the swamp. We quickly surmise that the snake is likely the path leading us to where we need to go. An interesting point comes up here as Nero is describing being able to see herself in the snake's scales. Lorith mentions that he doesn't see a snake, instead only a cloud of smoke, which is unusual since we just saw the snake from his perspective only moments ago. We reach the Tree of Whispers as literal heads line the branches. The heads are used as a way for it to speak to us. We tell the tree that we have come seeking Elias. The tree starts to get annoyed, saying that Elias is slippery since he owes the tree. It deals in thoughts and insight in exchange for a head. Elias is the first of them to escape payment. We asked the tree to tell us what he wanted, and in return, we might just be able to help the tree collect. Apparently, he sought a way to summon Lilith, but made another stop at a place beyond the tree's sight. Lorath believes that the place being described could be the place that Elias claimed his immortality. One of the heads mentions that that must be the reason why Thaisa has failed so dismally in reclaiming his head for the tree, revealing why Thaisa was hunting Elias. The tree tells us to seek a coffin beyond the shipwrecks, as it will take us to the location that we need to go, finding out what secrets are there since the tree actually doesn't know. We make camp for the night as Nairal points out that Rathma's prophecy spoke of a serpent, wondering if the large serpent that we saw was what Elias was looking for. Lorith says that he doesn't know, mentioning that Elias has become obsessed with Rathma's prophecy after hearing it. Since prophecies are riddles, not even the very wise can be sure of their meaning, but Elias believed that he could solve it, and when Laura told him to wait, he called him a fool. While breaking through the shipwreck, we come to a blocked door. Nairel mentions that she could maybe open the door from the other side, going by herself. She attempts to open the door, but we can hear a scream. We instead destroy the door and find her surrounded by drowned. Lorith mentions how bad of a situation this is, while Nairo is screaming that it burns. It turns out, that she's been infected by a bite on her arm, causing necrosis to spread in her body. Lorath says that we have little time to save her and puts a tourniquet around her bicep. And problem solved. No more arm, no more problem. Nero has passed out at this point, the missing arm probably having something to do with it, while Lorath tells her that she will become Herodrim one day and that he won't fail her. We leave to find the coffin while Lorath tends to Nero. We reach that coffin when the tree tells us not to fear this cradle. Colder beds than this await us yet. Once inside, it falls into the water, slowly sinking deep into the ocean while the sound of our breath grows fainter. 
We awake inside a temple with echoes of Elias still lingering. He speaks of Rothma, saying that he has come to this temple knowing the answers he seeks to help within. Another echo is Elias mentions that every tome, scroll and book in this temple provides the same answer. The only being willing to stand against the eternal conflict or against the prime evils was Lilith. Ironically, our protagonist sums up my thoughts on the matter very well. The day I'm done with this self-righteous bastard will be a great one. Elias cannot say if Lilith has good in her, but feels that the morality is a privilege of people in better situations. We are beyond the question of good or evil, but the question does remain, when he summons her, what will she do to us? He feels that he must prepare for anything, and since Rothma keeps the means of attaining immortality here, he plans to master it and then bring the mother home. Elias finds another book of Rathma, saying that he writes that when Inarius discovered Lilith's plan to overthrow the so-called natural order, he sealed her away. For thousands of years, Lilith sought to elevate humanity out of this cycle, fighting to secure us our birthright, sanctuary. We search further in and find Elias' finger. He hid a piece of himself in here to stay immortal. When we pick up the finger, the tomb begins to cave in and we fall unconscious. We awake next to Lorath and Narel. We ask Lorath how the hell we got here, and he tells us that he found us drifting in a coffin, clutching a severed finger. We tell him that we thought we had drowned, and explain that Elias had stored his life essence in his finger, granting him immortality. We quickly burn that bad boy like it's a s'more, breaking that immortality. Narel awakens and is pretty distraught that her arm is missing. She believes that we will just leave her, since she feels that she is now a hindrance. We tell her that we won't be leaving her. We head back to the keep to meet up with Donan and attempt for a second time to imbue the soul stone with the hatred essence. This time around, Lorath and Nairel will attempt to help. Thaisa mentions that she can feel something, that someone is coming. Elias is here. Lorath attempts to leave but is yelled at by Donan, telling him that he must stay if this is going to work. So we join Thaisa in confronting Elias. Thaisa tells Elias that the tree seeks its payment and he says that he will set the tree afire and cast our corpses onto the flames. Oof. We fight Elias once again, getting the best of him. Elias is now bloodied and battered, and asks how many times that we have to do this before we learn, that his life is not ours to claim. We tell him that we have been in the deepest chambers of the sunken temple, with the most goofy look on our face, might I add. It begins sinking into Elias that he is no longer immortal. While well, we remind him that he has no secrets from us. He does his best Batman trick and escapes, but Thaisa quickly follows. We meet back up with Lorath and inform him that we've wounded Elias as we follow his trail of blood. When we do find Elias, he's leaning up against some stones, injured. Lorath wishes to speak with him and a crow arrives at the branch nearby. I was thinking of narrating this part, but I think that the voice actor for Elias did an incredible job. So, for the first time during the story explained of Diablo 4, I would like to rewind and play the scene in its entirety. Oh, Elias. Was all this worth it then? Truly? I brought Lilith to Sanctuary. A thing no one thought possible. And when hell rises to sweep across this world, I should be there beside her, ready to push it back. You left me alone to cross the lines you would dare not attempt, and you have nothing to show for it. You are nothing but a wasted life. Do not look to forgive me, old man, because it is you who brought us here. Was it worth it? That is a coward's question, Lorath. It suits you. Elias of Aronok. Oh, spare me. Of your own free will, you swore an oath to the Tree of Whispers. This is not the life I deserve. Pretty crazy scene, I must say. And did you notice that Lorath did not say much after the speech that Elias just gave? Elias slowly bleeds out and dies, and the crow swoops in for some action. The thing straight up takes his head, flying away with it. 
When we return outside, Thaisa mentions that she can now hear laughter in the wind, meaning that Elias's head is now with the Tree of Whispers. She mentions that this is where she leaves us, since Elias was her goal the whole time, not Lilith, saying her concerns lie elsewhere. Donan asks where Lorith is, and we mention that we haven't seen him since Elias called him a coward. Donan asks if to prove his courage if Lorith has rode off alone to deal with Lilith, but we mention that Elias never actually told us where she was. Nairel points out that his head is now on the Tree of Whispers, so the tree would technically know where Lilith is going, suggesting that Lorath could ask the tree, but would have to pay the price. Donan asks what that price is, and Narelle says that the same that Elias paid, an eternity on the tree. Donan is devastated, yelling for us to hurry to the tree to stop him. When we arrive, Lorath has already made the deal with the tree, saying that Lilith has been two steps ahead of us for far too long, that the tree knew where she was and he asked. The answer was worth the price. Donan questions him, saying that he now owes the tree his head and that the day he dies, he will be taken to hang here with the others. Lorith asks if he needed Donan's permission, saying that it's done and to put it aside and focus on Lilith. He says that Lilith is on her way to absorb Mephisto's power, that she has found a gateway to hell and she approaches with the key, saying that the gate is under Chaldeum. And if she is already inside of hell, then we will follow her in. Nairel is concerned that only the four of us alone cannot complete such a task. But Lorith reminds her that it's our duty. The heads of the tree, including Elias, begin to laugh hysterically. We get more narration from Lorith, saying that it's a strange thing to know where you'll go when you die, but it's one less mystery to worry about. He feels he did what he had to do, whether it was the right choice or not. We needed answers, and we got them. Astaroth, the key to hell, Elias, everything has been leading us to this. And what we didn't know while being in the swamp was that Anarius and the Cathedral were planning a campaign of their own to strike at Lilith. Their battle would leave the world as a wasteland, and whoever won would show no mercy to whoever was left. Our only hope is to reach Lilith before Anarius, ominously mentioning that we couldn't have expected what happens next. We arrive in Tarsak and speak with Nairel. She mentions that Lorath and Donan have gone with the knights to Chaldeum, as they felt that it would be best for them to follow them as they march onto the gate. She asks us if she could ask us a personal question, to which we say yes, asking if we've ever felt like nothing that we do matters. We say more than we would like to admit. People call us a hero, but underneath we're still the same person we always were. Powerful, but flawed. Even though we try, we are unable to help Yonin or Nairel's mother, for example. She thanks us for being honest and said that we should meet up with the others in Chaldeum. Once we arrive, we can see that something very strange is happening in the city. Blood is falling from the sky. We mention that no mortal is capable of this kind of magic. We speak to Donan about the blood falling from the sky and he mentions the paragraph from Rothma's prophecy. Tears of blood rained on a desert jewel. We are witnessing cosmic history being made. It turns out that the knights are in the midst of sacking the city, and since the rain and hell spawn all spew from the gates of hell, it means that Lilith has already opened the way to hell. Lorith reiterates that if she consumes Mephisto's essence, Sanctuary is lost. As we get further into the city, we can see many of Lilith's cultists that have been slain and their bodies left out in the open for everyone to see. Nairel mentions that there's nothing of the light in this, Donan correcting her by saying that the display is the point. They mean to make an example of them. Light begins to shine down above us as it passes overhead. It's Anarius, as he is now entering the city to take part in the siege. Lorith thinks that Anarius is still our best shot of an ally that we have. We find some cultists as they begin chanting about the blood falling from the sky, mentioning that this is what the Lord of Hatred said. This worries Lorath and Donan, as the cultists once belonged to Elias and Elias belonged to Lilith, but for some reason they're now mentioning the name of Mephisto. We reach the Night Penitent members before Anarius is giving them a speech, telling them that the time of the prophecy has come that Lilith flees through the gate to hell, boasting that he will slay her in the cesspit that she calls a home, opening the way to the heavens. He restates a paragraph from Rathma's prophecy, a spear of light piercing hatred's heart. And for those that die in battle today, you may die heavenbound. Lorith asks him what his plan is after that. Anarius responds that the Herodrum is up to the same act as always, 
chasing after the battles of their betters, saying that the angels don't need them. Lorith requests the stone from Donan before telling Anarius that we don't need the angels either. Anarius pulls the stone from Donan's fingers, claiming it for himself, calling it hubris, that the Herodrum boasts of a mere fragment of what it once was, the world stone debased in the hands of fools, saying that Lilith dies only by his blade as the prophecy foretold. He leaves with the soul stone as we ask Lorath what we should do now. He mentions that nothing has changed and we should just continue on with our plan. Donan questions how Lorith could say that this changes nothing. Our one potential ally just ran off with our one weapon. Lorith says that he needs to stop Lilith and forget Anarius, as his pride makes him an unreliable ally. They suggest that we still have a valuable weapon, despite not having the soul stone. That weapon being us. We find Reverend Mother Prava outside. She welcomes Donan, welcoming him back and saying that the father will deliver us all. Donan is frustrated, saying that Anarius seized our soul stone. The Reverend Mother believes that his will is light and therefore always correct, mentioning how surprised she is that Donan still doubts them despite everything that they have done for him and Yorin. But at least Yorin doesn't have to see him like this. Donan attempts to attack her, but is stopped by Lorath. The Reverend Mother states that sin reaps consequences, and she knows that the father acted righteously. Lorath requests that we join them on their march to the gate, as it would be safer for the both of us. She gives a final speech to her knights about Anarius killing Lilith and Hal, and we begin our march. Donan pulls us aside during the walk and reminds us that we can't trust the Reverend Mother. Lorath agrees, but mentions that they have an army, and that we share a common goal. Along the way, we come head to head with Duriel, the Lord of Pain. He is one of the four lesser evils and the twin to Andariel. We manage to defeat him, but tensions are running high within the group. Lorath is frustrated that Donan didn't keep his cool with Prava, while Donan says that Lorath shouldn't have thrown away the stone as he did. Lorath goes over the plan one final time, stating that we need to reach Mephisto's domain, since across the Sea of Fire resides Astaroth's domain. And he wages that's why Lilith freed him, so that he could grant her across the Sea of Fire to her father's domain. They end up arguing again, before Nairel tells them to stop, saying that instead of arguing, let's do something about it and retrieve the stone back from Anarius. However, proposing another option, saying that using the soul stone on Lilith is the wrong choice. Instead, the soul stone should be used on Mephisto, stating that his powers of manipulation and hatred are already poisoning us. And since Lilith even fears him, why don't they? Lorith shuts it down and we continue towards the gate to hell. Once we arrive, we can see some blood petals on the floor, revealing a vision. Lilith stands before the gate of hell as she mentions that she can feel her father's fear, clutching the key and causing the door to open. We enter hell and I must say I can see why I got a 1 star rating on Yelp. Nairel mentions that everything is wrong here, while Donan says that mortals were never actually even meant to tread in this place. We find the remnants of a big battle from the forces of Prava as they cleared the path ahead. Lorath states that they were simply fodder for a broken angel's ambitions. We come across the Reverend Mother Prava as she lies injured upon the ground. When we move her body, we can also find the soul stone beneath her. Turns out she's actually alive, and she mentions that Anarius has followed Lilith into the spire, stating that salvation is coming. Lorath interrupts, telling her that no salvation is coming for these knights or her, since she is simply a tool for somebody that doesn't care about any of us, not to mention a thief, saying that she had the stone this entire time since we had been with her. She mentions that Anarius entrusted her with it before realizing that it's missing from her person. She calls us insolent heretics and servants of darkness, telling us that we will all be damned. Lorath mentions that she has been poisoned with hatred and that we should leave her, but Donan mentions that she isn't the only one and to remember why we are here and who we're fighting against, before giving Prava a tonic that should help her get to her feet, telling her to run for the portal and not to look back if she knows what's good for her. We regather as we now know that the cathedral was in shambles. We are on our own. We battle through the countless demons as Lorath compliments Donan, saying that he is good at leading people. Donan jokes that he should write this moment down since Lorath never compliments him. We begin to see the effects of the hatred domain wearing off. A giant goddamn demon dog appears. We need to fend it off, showing that the closer that we get to the cathedral and by proxy Lilith, the more powerful the demons are becoming. We see more blood petals on the ground, showing us what happened in the big battle. Mother Prava is walking barefoot in lava like an absolute badass as she looks towards the horizon within hell. 
A light slowly engulfs the army as Anarius joins the fight hovering overhead. He casts a light across the demons, and they now charge the knight's penitent. The soldiers set up in formation, ready for battle against Hell's forces. Anarius spots Lilith in the distance and goes after her, throwing his spear at her in an attempt to fulfill the prophecy. Another demon gets in the way to protect her, leaving Anarius to fend off the surrounding demons. Lilith enters the spire and Anarius follows after her and Lilith asks him if he remembers the whispers of the damned, referring to the millennia that he spent as Mephisto's prisoner. He tells her that words won't save her, while Lilith mocks him, saying that the soldier returns with such purpose, no longer the conflicted soul that she left behind. She asks him what he truly wants, to which he replies his rightful place in the heavens. She asks if that is why he seeks to destroy all that they have created, from sanctuary to even their son. He says that he did it to satisfy the heavens. Lilith points out that the heavens didn't rejoice when he killed his own son, since they don't even want him. Anarius stabs Lilith in the chest as the battle continues to rage outside. Lilith reminds Anarius that they made a choice and that the heavens will never forgive him. No matter what he tells himself or who he sacrifices, silence is his judgment. This causes Anarius to go into an emotional breakdown as he pleads to the heavens to tell him what he must do. Lilith takes this time to stab Anarius in the back as he screams out for help from the heavens. She tells him that he belongs in hell as she rips off his wings. We can see the light of Anarius dwindle as the forces of the Knight's Penitent crumble to the forces of hell outside. We close on Anarius' corpse melting into the floor as the dam surround him for eternity. We notify the others about what happened. Lorith points out that Lilith should be easier to trap since she's now weakened, almost like she's a Pokemon or something. We begin to realize that we've actually lost Lilith and Lorith believes that we could use the sightless eye to look for her. Donan hears a sound behind him and checks the pillar to investigate. One of the damned grabs him out of nowhere and claws open his stomach, severely wounding him. We manage to kill all of the undead around and check on Donan. He says that he is fine and mentions that the sightless eye is the only way that we have to find Lilith and that we need to hurry with that. We use the sightless eye and can see Lilith's current location. She is standing next to the sea of fire as Astaroth approaches her. He mentions that she is here wanting to collect her safe passage to the Cathedral of Hatred, pointing out the injury that Lilith now has from Minarius. He tells her that he will honor his promise and will help her face her father. As the vision ends, Lilith turns towards us, telling us that we were foolish to even use the sightless eye on her again. She traps us, becoming a prisoner in her own mind, stating that she could keep us here forever, but will offer us a different fate, telling us that we could be Sanctuary's greatest protector if we choose to, wishing to show us why the world has need of us. She says that ever since we drank her blood, she has been a part of us, carrying our hopes and fears in her heart gifting humans with free will, but they are so lost without a shepherd to guide them. We can see the priest from the church in the Vesk as a memory, saying that humans flock to these places for answers and to submit to the spectacle, saying that we also, much like her, see through that illusion. We can find a memory of Donan as he mourns Joran's death, as well as Vigo after he served his penance. Memories of people that we lost along the way, people that we couldn't save. Lilith points out that her son was wiser than the Herodrum, but he couldn't be a shepherd either. Anarius, Elias, Lorath wanted so badly to see their own meaning in the prophecy, they were blind to the simple truth of it, that we are all prisoners of the eternal conflict, the pawns of angels and demons, saying that it was incredibly human of Anarius to think that the prophecy was about him, suggesting that possibly humans inherited that vanity from him. We can find Elias down here too, as Lilith mentions that he believed that she would be the one to lead humans of Sanctuary, when in reality only a human can lead other humans, asking us to take on the role of shepherd for her, saying the real enemy is hatred, destruction and terror, the three prime evils. She feels that we can turn the tide in the eternal conflict in our favour, and it starts with Mephisto's destruction, wanting us to lead the battles to come, 
We can see the three statues of Diablo, Mephisto and Baal as we deny her offer. She tells us that we will be shackled here forever as waves of demons attack us. In the midst of the battle, a portal opens up as Mephisto offers us a helping hand. On the other side, we find ourselves back inside of the cave from the beginning of the story, as Mephisto tells us not to cower. He has come to free us from Lilith's trap. We ask him why he continues to help us, and he mentions that he saved us from the cave because he sensed that we could end Lilith, and that is all he wants. But he does admit that there will come a time when we will be enemies. But right now we need each other in order to defeat Lilith. He tells us to look at him in the eye as he brands us with his blessing, allowing us to traverse to his cathedral without fear or risk. Lilith asks, why would we follow Mephisto instead of her? Asking if we are truly that foolish. We mention that we don't serve either of them, but Lilith wants to know what Mephisto offered us, getting angrier and angrier when we don't answer her. We manage to wake from the nightmare and we can hear Nayrell crying. We look over at Donan and can see that he is in a very bad state. He tells Lorath to not even dare thinking of burying him in hell, to which Lorath jokes that he's too old to even haul his body out of hell. Lorath tells Donan that he should have come to him instead of the cathedral that he would have shown up for him and shared in his burden. Dona replies that he knows, and perhaps things would have gone differently with Skosglen and even Yonan if he did. He asks if it was enough, if Yonan would think it was enough before dying. Lorath tells his friend, yes, that he has done more than enough. We update Lorath, and he tells us to continue on without him, to trust our gut. We decide to continue onwards with Nairal as Mephisto appears again. We tell her that this is the wolf that helped us escape Lilith, before she realizes that the wolf is the form taken by Mephisto. She asks us how we could trust a prime evil, to which Mephisto replies that trust had nothing to do with it. Instead, we came to reason, which he advises Nyrell to do the same, since if Lilith takes his essence, Sanctuary will be lost forever. He tells us to enter the portal as it will lead us straight to the Cathedral of Hatred, and that Lilith is almost there. We mention to Nayrell that we will set an ambush and will distract her while Nayrell traps her in the stone. Mephisto loves the idea, saying that we can leave the stone with him and he will ensure that Lilith never troubles our world again. We return home and he will remain in hell. Nayrell mentions that something isn't right and Mephisto leading us to this moment we are in his realm, doubting if we should even be doing what he wants, noting that between him and Lilith, he is actually the greater evil of the two. We ask if she wishes to use the stone on him, and I'm not sure if we just forgot that we're in his damn house or something, but Mephisto hears this entire conversation, telling us to think very carefully that the path suggested would lead to failure for all of us. Nayrell points out that Mephisto is afraid, but we admit that it could work. We imprison Mephisto in the stone, and then we could head back to Lorath. Then we can seal the gates of hell behind us, leaving Lilith here. Mephisto doesn't like the idea, considering if Lilith catches us before we leave hell, he is essentially a sitting duck for her, and she will claim his power, asking that we don't let our hate towards him blind us from the common sense. We tell Nayrell that we cannot trust our own thoughts about Mephisto, telling her to make the decision that she feels is the right one. Mephisto looks at her and reminds her that the lives and those of all humanity depend on what she does next. No pressure. She plunges the soul stone into Mephisto and thus trapping him within. He opens up a portal for them to exit while still in wolf form, and I'm not entirely sure how he can still do that while being in the soul stone, but sure. We plan to stay behind and face Lilith, while she will go and meet back up with Lorath, saying that they will wait for us at the chapel. Lilith now approaches and mentions one of the scariest lines you could possibly ever hear from an antagonist. You will learn pain only glimpsed in myth. That's as badass of a line as you will get. We fight Lilith and manage to get the best of her before she turns into what I believe is her true form, since it looks so much like Mephisto's true form, but we beat her all the same. Blood petals fall from the sky as Lilith mentions that Sanctuary was built as a refuge from the conflict, but here we are again. She gave us free will and we squandered it, wasting it on a crusade that we don't even understand, saying that we chose tyranny when offered freedom, calling it a poor legacy for her gift. Without her, we would have no victory and its cost will be more than we can pay as we see glimpses of Mephisto. She straight up gets thanos as she begins to turn to dust and crumbles. We look on to see blood petals in the air beginning to crumble as well. 
We return to Lorath and tell him that Lilith is dead and Mephisto is trapped within the Soul Stone, before realizing that Nayrel never returned to him, surmising that she might have gone straight to the Desert Chapel. We decided to help carry Donan's body out of hell and head to the chapel together, before getting some more narration from Lorith. He mentions that we are now truly alone, that the creators of Sanctuary, Angel and Demon, Father and Mother, are dead that we were made from their image, that their conflict is a part of us and always will be. He wonders if there is any truth to Lilith's vision, an escape from the eternal conflict, before conceding that these questions don't befit an old man, as he doesn't have much time left, the struggle is no longer his anymore. He wonders if we will walk the same path as all the children who rebelled against their parents, in the process, becoming them. But he hopes that the Wanderer and Nairel avoid the fate of Rothma, and everyone else who tried and failed to overcome our flawed nature. And that concludes the story of Act 6 of Diablo 4. However, don't go anywhere just yet as there is an epilogue that we will jump straight into now. It's not very long, so let's get into it. We arrive back at the Desert Chapel and find no sign of Nayrel anywhere. We wonder if Mephisto could have corrupted Nayrel, but Lorath believes that it would have taken much more time for it to seep from the stone. She left for her own reasons. We mentioned that she could have returned to the vault, but the group of night penitent soldiers arrived behind us. The one leading is Yosef, the mad priest that saved our life in Nevesk. He tells us that he is here for the Herodrum before attacking. We regretfully kill them all and can find a note from Prava, ordering them to find the Herodrum since they have been using dark magics to bear a great evil into our world. We are shocked by what we just did, telling Lorath that Yosef saved our life once and they are not our enemies. Lorath shrugs it off, telling us that he intends to go and bury Donan with his son, while we go to the vault and check for Nayrel. As we approach the vault, we can hear multiple flashbacks of Nayrel from the past, before finding a note in the vault. It is written in Herodric code and cannot be deciphered by us. We return to Lorath, as he is now finished burying Donan with his son Yorin. We give him the letter to read, and while I could narrate this, it feels appropriate to play the scene out in its entirety so you can see it as it's presented. I spent a lot of time learning this code, so I hope you remember how to read it, Morath. Because you are the last Horadrim now. My mother would have wanted me to stay with you. She believed the Horadrim had all the answers. I don't know if she'd recognize this person I'm becoming. It's hard for me to think about her right now. But then I remember you and Donan. You weren't all-knowing Haradrim. You were bitter. You were uncertain. But you were always true friends. That's what I hold on to. Because there is so much further to go. Your imperfection gave me hope. And we will need it to face what comes next. To face him and his brothers. I don't know how much time I have. But there has to be a better answer. And I have to find it. Alone. I know he'll want to go with me. But people have already died because I was not careful enough. I can't risk you too. If 
I've misjudged, the world is going to need you to survive and clean up the mistakes I leave behind. I know you don't want to hear this, but you don't get to quit. Not again. If everything works out as I am hoping, we will never see each other again. And that concludes the story of Diablo 4 in its entirety. Well, at least until the DLCs come out anyway. I really hope that you have enjoyed the series as it was released and it's been very fun making it. If you made it to the end of the video, please write Donan in the comments down below to show that you did. Remember to like and subscribe for more content in the future, and maybe check out some of our older stuff to see if it's for you. Until next time, peace.